We are actually starting with our second panel now. Uh, it's focused on shrinking spaces, where we are going to talk more about and focus more about uh, criminalization of the migration, but as well uh, on criminalization of people who are uh, in any way trying to support people passing through the Balkans and human rights defenders. Uh, with me today, uh, I have Eleni, sorry, for Velvasakis. Uh, she's a lawyer from RSA, from coming from Greece. Uh, Karolina Augustova, who is actually a researcher coming from the post-fellow uh, post fellow doctorate, uh, sorry, fellow post-doctorate from Aston University in Bright, uh, Birmingham. Uh, she is actually usually uh, focusing. Uh, her research is focused on the borders of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Eastern uh, Turkey. Uh, then Tayana Tadic, who is, who is act, an activist and who uh, worked in Croatia but now lives in Germany because of her activism. And with us online is uh, via Zoom is. Uh, do we have Marta? Uh, Marta Stoic from. Uh, Belgrade. She is also a researcher, ethnographer, ethnographist, and sorry, uh, eth ethnologist and anthropologist from the it Institute of Ethnography uh, from Belgrade. So welcome, Marta, as well. And we are going to focus on, I guess, uh, countries along the Balkan route. Uh, we already spoken during the first panel a uh, bit, uh, bit addressed the issue of attempts of criminalization in order to stop migration or to so-called uh, manage migrations. Uh, we did face certain kind of uh, aspects of uh, criminalization in Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially in the local areas bordering with the uh, EU, but also within uh, within. Uh, within the country. Some of activists were actually uh, faced arrests, uh, different, form of, uh, different form of pressure, even violence. Uh, sometimes as well, this was used in political purposes. Uh, so, and of course, uh, in what, during our research as well, we kind of discovered as well, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, it was really significant uh, depending on the election period, how people, uh, how the respond and how the hate in, uh, in public space was against a uh, hate speech uh, uh, focused on against me, uh, people on the move was actually kind of announced and how the criminalization around that, uh, especially in the aspects of the restrictions, and I, I guess, Carolina, you can actually reflect a bit later on, uh, a restriction of movement in Bosnia and Herzegovina was in particularly present. So I don't know whether, shall we start from Eleni and then just somehow, uh, this is mixture of kind of Turkey and Bosnia, but no, no, I'm just thinking whether, so let's start with Greece and then, yes. Uh, good morning from me too. Uh, on behalf of RSA, I would like to thank uh, um, Henrik Boyle Institute for the invitation to join you today. Um, it's, it's really interesting, all the discussions passing through the developments and the state of play in all the regional, uh, let's say the Balkan area. Uh, I think we can identify a lot of similarities uh, with Greece. Uh, First of all, uh, we are all talking about uh, populations on, population on the move, that like they are on transit, people that they don't really wish to stay in our countries, but they have to pass through, but as well as a uh, lack of uh, uh, effective reception systems and uh, um, asylum systems uh, being uh, poorly managed or with many gaps. Um, at the same time, I think we share a lot of uh, commonalities with regard to the repression towards uh, the civil society organizations supporting refugees and migrants. Uh, it is widely accepted and, and all uh, European institutions would agree and would always emphasize that civil society orga organizations uh, have consistently contributed to strengthening the rule of law, accountability of the state, transparency and protection of human rights, and particularly when talking about the rights of minorities and the most vulnerable. 
This has also always been the case with Greece. <laughs> Uh, yet things in reality seem to be a little bit more difficult, dif different and more difficult for civil society organizations to operate. Uh, Refugee Support in the Aegean, RSA, is a non-profit civil society organization that aims to provide free legal support to refugees, uh, to monitor and highlight human rights violations and provide social and humanitarian assistance to particularly vulnerable people. Uh, Article 3 of uh, RSA statute includes as one of its objectives the development of activity in support of persons under reportation. What, according to the competent authority of the Ministry of Migration, seems to be an illicit objective. Greece, in 2020, through different administrative decisions and regulations uh, that successively at the adoption of the letter a regulation abolished the former, uh, introduced a, um, a highly restrictive framework for the, uh, for the registration of NGOs, specifically working in the field of asylum and migration. Um, in that way, it made the registration and certification a precondition for their operation in the field anywhere in Greece. The registration and certification procedure demand numerous burdensome requirements, both formal and substantial, such as submission of detailed audit reports by state licensed accountants and the obligation of the organizations to meet very vague criteria such as organizational capacity and efficiency. Organizations working in the field of migration have to struggle not only with increased financial costs and demanding resources, but also with short and strict procedural deadlines that have been gradually and gradually reduced to a few days, while at the same time the administration's um, notices and deadlines for response have doubled, serving of course administrative convenience. The NGO registry legislation in Greece introduced by the government targets solely and in a discriminatory way NGOs working in the field of migration and asylum and allows a great margin of appreciation for the authorities to reject the applications for registration through vague assessments of their activities and work, while similarly, vaguely, authorities shall assess an individual's activity and personality. Not to mention that the law involves processing of specific categories of personal data, criminal records, without even satisfying basic guarantees of the general data protection regulation. Uh, moreover, the authorities may remove an organization or individual from the registry on the basis of the abstract case of illegal acts without defining what it really means and uh, or when they find uh, the organization's activity work as poor. The different pieces of legislation introduced in Greece have attracted criticisms from various national and international bodies, such as UN Special Rapporteurs, uh, Council of Europe Parliamentary uh, Assembly uh, Human Rights Committee, the European uh, Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, uh, ECRE, European Council of Refugees and Exile, the Greek Ombudsman, uh, the Athens Bar Association. The unfettered discretion to reject an organization or, uh, refuse or remove from the registry on the basis of an abstract and vague criteria is highlighted by all of these bodies. The lack of legal certainty and the extent of the interference of the regulation with the freedom of association is also a very significant concern. As far as the European Commission is concerned, the Commission has, with regard to the registry law, expressed their doubts in the previous rule of law reports. Yet, despite parliamentary questions posed to the Commission uh, by, in the European Parliament since 2020, uh, where Commission has been requested to express its views on the compatibility of the registry with EU law, the Commission is monitoring the implementation of the legislation in question and its assessment is still pending. Back to RSA case study now. So while we all in this room would agree that uh, supportive actions uh, for persons and uh, actions of persons and organizations in favor of persons under deportation, not only contradict, do not contradict, but also implement 
national and European and international legislation in force. In October 2021, the Special Secretary for Stakeholder Coordination, a long title of the Greek Ministry of Migration, found that this is not a legitimate aim. Uh, the Secretary rejected RSA's application to the National Registry of NGOs working in the field of asylum and migration in Greece. In the case of RSA, despite the fact that all formal and substantive requirements provided by law were met, and despite the positive uh, opinion recommendation of the competent body before the Secretary's decision, the Secretary concluded, without even telling us in, in which provisions, without referring to any specific law, that the reference of Article 3 of our statute to develop activity for the benefit of persons subject to deportation is contrary to the Greek legislation. Um, additionally, the Secretary invoked a reason referring to technical procedural matters. Uh, it uh, uh, mentioned that one of the requested uh, certificates submitted was outdated. Uh, of course, if it takes more than one and a half year to re for the administration to examine an application, all documents can become <laughs> outdated. Yet none of the authorities asked RSA to provide an updated one, uh, although additional documents were all the time available and provided by RSA. Um, this is nothing more of another illustration of the onerous bureaucratic regulation system established by the recent framework in Greece. A framework that results in arbitrariness and is implemented to the detriment of the work of civil society and the rights of the organizations. Such a caustic, complex and bureaucratic framework dissuades organizations and individuals to work in the field. And maybe this is a, an, an um, desired aim. The current state of play is that RSA administrative request for review of the rejection decision has been rejected also, and currently there is a judicial review application before the Supreme Administrative Supreme Court of Greece, the Council of State. This is to be examined in June 2022. In addition to the extraordinary decision of the ministry that contradicts international and EU standards, the narrative of the government officials that followed the rejection, and in particularly the discourse that uh, as to what constitutes an acceptable activity in support of persons under deportation or not legally residing in Greece, as well as the confusion that was created by the official statements referring to different kinds of assistance, is indicative of the hostile political discourse towards civil society that stands in solidarity or in support of refugees. It's also uh, indicative of the hostile climate for refugees themselves. Throughout uh, 2021, the Greek government has continued to use hostile discourse against civil society, even in its official communication with UN bodies as well as, as in its submissions in judicial proceedings. The Greek government maintained the view that, I quote, some of these groups have even come to question the Greek sovereignty over areas of the Greek islands. This statement, of course, has not been corroborated by any evidence. The government has openly acknowledged that it employs criminal prosecution as a tool to affect civil society's freedom of expression and to drive humanitarian organizations out of the country. I quote from a recent report by Kathy Merini, a, a Greek uh, widespread uh, newspaper that reads, in private conversation, government officials acknowledge that one of the main objectives of investigation was to remove mainly European volunteers, activists from the greek Turkish sea borders at the time of a particularly high tension between the two countries. The objective was met in real politic terms, since members of NGOs left the maritime field after being alarmed by the severe felony charges attached. Problems, however, arise when the time comes for cases to be tried in court. Faced with the prospect of charges not standing in court, trials against NGOs better serve the aim when they are still pending. 
This is also echoed by a recent statement of the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights on the pending case against ERSI before the court of Mytilini. The fact, the rapporteur says, the fact that authorities have spent more than three years investigating the case has been a deterrent to civil society working for migrant rights in Greece. And as the numerous instances of illegal pushbacks remain without a thorough examination, government officials uh, invoked uh, information that proves that journeys are encouraged at times by NGOs active in the area. Similarly, they did not hesitate to attribute the 2020 destruction of Moria, the notorious camp of Lesbos, to NGOs actions. The frequent allegations in the public realm about NGOs' illegal activity or mismanagement of funds is unfortunately widely reproduced in national media. Moreover, derogatory and defamatory language against the civil society is, usually, is routinely used in the Greek parliament. The Hellenic Solution, a political party, has recently described NGOs as a Turkish Trojan horse, uh, for profit or trafficked private NGOs uh, responsible of anti-Greek positions. And uh, the same party has referred to NGOs as cancer and business profiting from European funding and has called for their closure in plenary. This intensifying hostile narrative towards NGOs has led to the increased hostility of the local population leading even to racist incidents and violent attacks to NGOs and the personnel in Lesbos in March 2020. Such, and, and the, the following months, that uh, uh, April and May. Such discourses, along with the implementation of a restrictive regulatory framework, specifically for the operation of the NGOs in the field of migration, constitute clear, disproportionate, and arbitrary restrictions to civil society space and role. And it should alert all European and international bodies, including the European Commission. We must recall that limitations to the role of the civil society in the field does have a potential, but not undesirable by some governments, effect on the rights of refugees and migrants. Rights for which the Greek and the European authorities are until now at least officially claiming committed to protect. Um, it seems to us that there is no other way to go forward than continuing to protect the same rights for which we are accused of uh, uh, showing an illegal behavior. And I think we all would agree that uh, we need to be alerted on all government um, defamation and smear campaigns. That's, that's all from me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I mean, it's really re interesting. And I was actually reflecting how, first of all, how the, the narrative of the government is actually around defending sovereignty. So yes, of course, I mean, we deal with the kind of issues around borders, which are again, uh, national, nationalist. But then they play the, the, same, the same kind of, a uh, game with sovereignty when it comes to either uh, e activists or registration, I mean, their application of, but smear campaigns as well, like in a sense to steer the patriotism with the local population to, to kind of, to not just to destroy the solidarity, but to also become hostile towards the NGOs, uh, activists, and everyone dealing in this field. So, I mean, I really, I really, and I, I would actually go now to Tiana because I think her experience and she could actually reflect more uh, exactly about these uh, narratives around uh, governments, direction, I mean, create, I mean, creation, creation of, creating, uh, you, using sovereignty to defend the kind of government's position against them, against uh, activists actually, and uh, people on the move with respect to, this is the, the second segment, which is more in the sense of the migration management, so. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all of us who are activists and working in migration are traitors of the national cause, are the, in Croatia, maybe the reason uh, we were being framed as the reason we might not enter Schengen, you know, it's not because of the 
government failed to <laughs> do what they needed yeah. to do, but it was all our fault. And uh, all of the NGOs and the activists and volunteers who were active since 2015 uh, were originally seen as allies uh, to the state. And they had, I mean, they had a very tenuous relationship with the state, but they were providing a vital support because the states were totally overwhelmed you know by the arrivals and they were unprepared for the scale and the complexity and the immediacy of the tasks that needed uh, to be done and uh, this has shifted of course as the governmental discourses also went into militarization and securitization and migration started to be framed as a security threat and this is when they uh, anti-migrant policies started to harden, there were different laws implemented, and the, the attitude towards NGOs in many states has actually shifted. And suddenly we are uh, colluding with the smugglers, we are the criminals, we are the, for, for example, people in the Mediterranean who do search and rescue operations are pull factors. And uh, then we, I don't know, we encourage new arrivals and uh, stuff like that. Uh, but, and there is, of course, no clear evidence for these accusations, for this contention. But this uh, suspicion alone is enough to, uh, to harm our reputation in the eyes of the public and in the eyes of the donors. For example, we had um, uh, situations in which, in Croatia specifically, uh, my former organization and my colleagues here from the Center for Peace Studies, uh, immediately after we are in the media, immediately after we do some very visible advocacy work for the human rights uh, of refugees, uh, we get death threats, we get rape threats, we get our, our offices were vandalized a number of times. And this is um, like the government acts with really, uh, with impunity, with everything they do. They push people back with impunity. They, uh, uh, they, uh, you know, they don't respect human rights. They hurt uh, the people who try to get them to respect said human rights and with all without any consequences. And uh, this is also in addition to what Eleni said to like bureaucratic hurdles and uh, uh, let's say, um, and all and a little bit more like tangible things like uh, entering our premises without warrants, asking for documents from us, asking for documents from people who come to us, and and they are frequent attempts of intimidation, you know, in a way. And uh, another example was in Croatia after we announced a press conference where we are supposed to speak about uh, the pressure, the police pressure on, uh, act on NGOs and lawyers who are supporting the family of Medina Husseini in uh, their case uh, in seeking justice after her death. Uh, both myself and my colleagues from uh, the Center for Peace Studies were, um, who were scheduled to speak at this press conference were uh, um, summoned for informative talks at the police station at the same time when the police, when the, sorry, when the press conference was supposed to happen. Yeah, so these are only, um, and these uh, attempts to intimidate us went much further. For example, in my kind of very personal case, my life partner was targeted by the state and uh, he was, uh, all of this happened in the context of uh, the advocacy and strategic litigation for uh, in the case of Medina Husseini. And my partner, for example, had his international protection revoked after he refused to become an informant for the security and intelligence agency. And uh, beforehand, he experienced harassment from the authorities who threatened that they will take his asylum, who threatened that they will deport him to Iraq, and all of these uh, wonderful things. And this revocation was again based on allegations that he, he's a threat to national security. So again, a similar thing that we saw that Mercija said, we saw in Macedonia, we see you know, in Greece, we see everywhere. And that also he misrepresented his sectarian affiliation and the potential danger he faces in Iraq. And of course, the authorities during all this time were very aware of the nature of our relationship. We were never hiding this. And during, uh, during the trial, uh, Omar didn't have access to the secret file 
his lawyer didn't have access to the secret file. Only the judge who has security clearance is allowed to access this file. So uh, in essence, you know, you are defending yourself from something and you have no idea what you're defending yourself from. And uh, because, you know, they are marked secret by the Security and Intelligence Agency. And uh, in January 2021, the administrative court in Zagreb actually dismissed his appeal against the revocation and completely ignored the entire body of evidence we submitted. We had five expert opinions. We had official documents from Iraq. We had many, many things to prove his claims, but they completely ignored all of this. And they said, no, we, the security and intelligence agency said this, that's it not our problem anymore. And he was ordered to leave the European economic area voluntarily. We all know what voluntarily, you know, there's no voluntarily in this context, or be forcibly removed. And in his case, being forcibly removed would, be, would mean that he would be deported to Iraq. And he filed a request to try to stay, uh, to extend these 30 days. But uh, as he, of course, has further appealed the case at the high administrative court, but he has not received an answer from the sector of border police, whom I have also publicly criticized in my media appearances. And uh, even they even assured us that all of the documents were sent in time, but we haven't received an answer. And you always have to get an answer, even if it's a no. And in the end, he, fearing deportation to Iraq, he had to leave Croatia. And eventually he sought uh, international protection in Germany. And, but the authorities there now seek to return him to Croatia on the basis of the Dublin procedure. And in a quite bizarre uh, moment, Croatia initially in October refused, saying that we revoked his asylum, he is a threat to national security, we don't want him here. And then two months later, when Germany requested it again, for some reason, they accepted without any arguments. So now currently we are, of course, fighting that and fighting, appealing this decision at the administrative court in Berlin. And because in particular, because his return to Croatia would mean possible reformant to Iraq, where he could face torture, where he could face uh, inhumane and degrading treatment or even death. But what has bothered me a lot in this case that Omar has has been uh, sort of just a footnote in in the whole story of my work, myself as a privileged, you know, European who was just I was OK, I picked up my stuff and I went to Germany. Yeah, sure. You know, I'm I don't work now. It's there are a lot of complications in our life, but my life directly is not endangered. And this is, this is something that we see uh, all across Europe. Like when you see uh, the, the public advocacy for many on, an organization, you would think that white European people are the main people who are at risk of this, while it's the opposite. The primary um, group who's being targeted are people on the move, refugees and migrants. Usually, uh, these are people of color, and usually they're of Muslim faith, which is often, as in his case, used against them. And while uh, we have seen, you know, the, with these changes in policies and law, we have seen the enormous expansion of uh, deportation facilities, of detention facilities, where people are imprisoned for the simple act of seeking shelter, for trying to find a better life in Europe. And these are the people who are languishing in these detention centers or in prisons after crossing a border, even though the act of crossing a border is an administrative infraction, it's a misdemeanor, it's not a felony, it's, it's not a crime, yet they are the ones who are called illegal. And this is, um, for, there are two more uh, cases that I would like to highlight. For example, in Malta, we have uh, three teenagers from uh, Africa who stand accused of terrorism. So in, uh, I think in March 2019, there they fled Libya on a rubber boat, which was holding uh, 108 people. And they were of course at risk of drowning. And the cargo ship approached them and they, they were rescued. 
And then the crew of the ship was instructed by then the European military operation that was happening in the Mediterranean at the moment to return them to Libya. So to return them to Libya in the horrific conditions where in the 21st century people are being sold as slaves in these conditions. And of course, the, the people protested their return and they convinced uh, the crew uh, to steer north, to go to Malta. And during the protest, of course, nobody was hurt, nothing was damaged, yet these three teenagers were arrested and now they, they face charges of terrorism and could actually spend a very long time in prison. And another case uh, comes from Greece, many colleagues will probably know it's the Samos too, and uh, where in uh, November 2020, a boat was in distress and uh, it capsized. And uh, on the boat were a person who is only identified by his initial N and Hassan, <coughs> and uh, among the other passengers were N's six-year-old son and uh, Hassan's family, which includes his uh, disabled mother. And they fled Afghanistan and they were trying to find safety in Europe. And uh, they say that the Greek Coast Guard was notified of the emergency and that it took them several hours to come to the scene, but they didn't carry out a rescue. And survivors uh, testified that they saw a boat coming two times, that they uh, saw a boat uh, approaching the scene twice, but they didn't rescue them. And in the morning, the next day, um, some of the people, they survived, but uh, Anne's little boy, who was six years old, didn't. His body was found on the rocks. And so Anne has lost his only child. It's devastating, it's devastating. And after he nearly drowned, nearly also lost his life, he was arrested. And only after pressure from his lawyer and from the UNHCR, they led him to see his son and to identify his body. And of course, then he was put into pretrial detention and was the first, actually, asylum seeker who was uh, charged with endangering the life of his own child. And he's facing up to 10 years of imprisonment, while Hassan was also arrested because during the journey, he had to steer the boat. We all know this is the case with many people who try to uh, cross the Aegean or the Mediterranean. The smugglers force them into boats, usually with threats, of, with the weapons, and said, you have to steer the boat. What the other choice is death. They have no choice. And he is uh, charged now with the transportation of uh, 23 third country nationals into Greek territory without permission, that is smuggling, with the, additionally with the aggravating circumstances of uh, endangering the lives of 23 uh, people and causing the death of one and son. And he's fa now he's facing, I mean, this is incredible, like a life sentence. And he's facing a, a sentence that amounts to 230 years, 230 years for trying to stay alive. And the end's case, endangering the life of his own child is the first of its kind, actually. But the, the smuggling charges that are brought against Hassan are not actually an isolated incident. This is what um, this is kind of typical of another uh, aspect of Europeans of uh, Europe's policy of deterrence and of criminalizing people on the move. And this was documented by CPT, Aegean Mig uh, Migrant Solidarity, Borderline Europe, and Deportation Monitoring Aegean. And this, the filing of such charges has been systematically uh, carried out by the Greek state to criminalize migration for several years. And the basis of this is the notion that any person found to have driven uh, a vehicle across Greek borders carrying people who entered without uh, authorization, who are seeking protection, is committing a crime, even if this person themselves if, then is seeking protection. So, and usually uh, from what I've seen, people uh, routinely arrest people, sorry, not people, police, <laughs> routinely arrest one or two persons and they send them just straight from the boats uh, to prison. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tana. I'm just not sure. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, it is, I mean, I think that every year we are seeing and testifying 
quite a lot of new ways, imaginative ways, imaginative mm -hmm. under the <laughs> inverted yeah. commas, how the people are not uh, imprisoned, limited, like really not allowed to ask for asylum, to ask for kind of safety, protection. And every year, I mean, I keep say, keep thinking, okay, this is the wor like this is the worst, the and worst. then and then it just happens. There is a new example, mm -hmm. and I I mean, with for example, I'm just gonna do the reflection with Bosnia and Herzegovina. The, unfortunately, we do not have any uh, human rights monitoring, and especially with respect to uh, issues around migration. But we kind of have quite lots of people. Like we keep saying, you seeing the smuggling cases. Mm -hmm. Luckily, at the moment. Bosnian police is not as imaginative. I mean, yeah. they, they, they are, they are similar. The point being, the patterns used to criminalization are actually somehow in, uh, somehow transferred. There is a knowledge transfer of this imaginative process, and I kind of think that we are going to face more and more like war situations, like yeah. unimaginable situations. But uh, again, they are just going to be kind of used uh, across the, across the, let's say, the, the Balkan route. But I'm kind of assuming even e within the European Union, there are examples. And especially with your case, for example, in Omar's case, it, it is something that is highly problematic in a sense that uh, German or Berlin, Berlin is actually considering returning you to uh, Omar as well to, uh, to Croatia and where there are proofs already that he is being persecuted, I mean, targeted and persecuted yeah. there and exactly. that there is. Yeah. And not only this, like I was reading the very, the legalese German and their decision why to return him. And in one part, they said, well, you know, Croatia, Croatia is a member of the European Union. They, it's, uh, you can suppose they will um, respect the Geneva Convention. They will uh, respect the European Convention on Human Rights, the rule of law, totally. Everything works in Croatia. So yeah, maybe he should, you know, try to ask for asylum again there. And I mean, meanwhile, the, the recent developments in Croatia, you know, including the verdict from the European Court of Human Rights in the Medina Husini case, and the visit from the Committee for the Prevention of Torture and then Human and Degrading Treatment all confirmed that, like, rule of law in Croatia, human rights in Croatia, like, you must be joking. I mean, we have so many, yeah. I mean, Croatia is not alone, but we have Croatia. so many cases from Croatia, violent cases from yeah. Croatia, and then claiming that Croatia is respecting human rights is really... Uh, joke. Yeah. I will just turn now mm -hmm. to Marta and ask Marta just to kind of have her presentation and reflect on Serb the situation in Serbia a bit and then we can, I'm looking into <laughs> yeah, monitors up there so and then we'll have Caroline, uh, Carolina and then we can just for, move to discussion mm -hmm. because interesting things have been really raised and important things. Well, thank you. Uh, first, um, uh, on the one side, we have a uh, criminal criminalization of solidarity and disabling and even criminalizing of monitoring. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we have a legalization of illegal or extra legal practices which are conducted by state or international actors, like official formal actors, agencies, organizations, and so on. Uh, so we have a kind of pervasion of legality. Uh, on, on one side, we have uh, repression, uh, which is uh, circumventing uh, human rights and laws, uh, and it is becoming a norm, uh, while uh, some human approach is increasingly being denounced and framed as illegal, or at least uh, initiated by those who want uh, to harm the state, as Tana has said. Uh, uh, Serbia is uh, part of the Western Balkan states, so which are in the process of accession into the European Union, and as the others has to conform their uh, institutional framework, work, uh, uh, meaning uh, uh, especially uh, legal framework and uh, institutions responsible for migration, according to the demands from the EU. Uh, but uh, by doing this, uh, it is uh, uh, 
not only copy pasting uh, some uh, uh, bad practices and formulations from the existing leg legislation, but also it uh, is uh, using uh, migration management for it, it, uh, different goals than managing migration itself. Uh, since uh, 2015, the end of 2015, uh, we can um, uh, see the attempt uh, uh, of the state to monopolize access to migration, to migration management and also to, to any kind of solidarity structures. Um, everything, uh, any kind of dissent or critique of uh, the manner how it is uh, conducted is uh, framed uh, uh, through higher goals, that the state has a higher goals and that uh, 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 not asking question uh, and not criticizing uh, is something that should be actually supported if we want the end goal that is accession into the European Union. Um, also, uh, in, in Serbia, what we can uh, also witness is that uh, uh, movement of uh, people on the move is becoming more and more criminalized as such. The only uh, legal existence of people on the move is uh, shrinked uh, to the places of encampment, uh, usually uh, uh, which are official camps. And this has started uh, in uh, 2016 as a trend, which can be followed, um, especially with the height uh, during uh, um, that emergency situation in uh, the beginning of uh, COVID-19 pandemics. And uh, uh, where actually uh, the state is collecting people from the streets, from any kind of free movement, free, I don't know, existence into the state organized camp system. And while doing so, the, the state is framing uh, attempts to uh, uh, solidarize with people on the move in different way, including the work of a civil sector organization as attempts to destabilize the state by creating a parallel system of uh, whatever, managing migration. Um, this uh, I will um, uh, I will uh, would like to focus on uh, actually three topics. Uh, how on the other on the other side we have uh, invisibilization of uh, some uh, repressive activities of the state uh, and um, uh, shrinking spaces for uh, uh, any kind of. Um, um, uh, support of people on the move by civil sector organizations. So one is defense. Uh, their uh, first notions of, the, uh, of defense have been just um, uh, the offense which is being built uh, near the, actually on the border of Serbia with Northern, Northern Macedonia uh, came right out of the blue uh, in media. Uh, uh, no one actually knows who, uh, there is no free access data that I can access uh, as a researcher uh, who initiated the, the building up of the fence and also how that process is going on. Uh, the excuse for making the fence was to uh, control uh, the movement, uh, actually to impose an uh, obstacle to uncontrolled movement in COVID times and especially of uh, people on the move who are coming without any uh, uh, like uh, uh, bypassing uh, any kind of um, uh, legal detection. Uh, so uh, uh, we conducted a small research uh, last uh, summer in the area and uh, the invisibilization of fence is really striking because people who actually live some 10 or 15 kilometers from it are not even aware of its existence. Uh, but uh, uh, according to that uh, legal um, provision, how it was um, uh, enabled the, the, the building of the fence, uh, the, the land was confiscated from people who live nearby. Uh, uh, their crop fields and so on has been taken and the uh, fence is being built there. Uh, now we also have uh, no information how the work is going on, how long the fence is, and again, uh, who is, I don't know, financing and uh, what are their, the consequences of the, its existence and so on. Um, 
Also, uh, we have uh, uh, by uh, fortifying uh, borders, and uh, we have um, two uh, two processes happening. Uh, one is uh, that uh, militarization of state borders, as you know, in European Union. Uh, uh, is characterized by demilitarization of borders, meaning that the army is not the uh, organ, uh, agency or um, uh, who is uh, controlling borders, but uh, police. Uh, but what we actually have is that high, uh, like uh, technical militarization and also behavior of um, border agents, uh, which is uh, like um, following more military logic. Uh, also, borders as such become uh, no-go spaces for regular citizens, for researchers, journalists, and so on. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, in that way, with uh, fattening of border areas uh, where military presence is stronger, we have a kind of really technically shrinking uh, spaces where any kind of research of migration can happen physically. Uh, on the other side, we have that uh, trend of uh, encampment of people on the move and illegalization of their stay outside the state run system. So we have small no-go areas, which are those camps, which are proliferating and popping like mushrooms after the rain in, in the state, uh, which are again, again uh, um, like uh, prevented for outsiders to get uh, uh, inside and get some information what is happening. Uh, so uh, by doing so, we have that uh, repression of monitoring of what is happening. Again, uh, there are a lot of different um, agents and agencies, European, like police and Frontex and so on, which are operating directly on the territory of Serbia and also of some other Western Balkan states. But there is no information that we can get how many, what are, what are they, I don't know, uh, the reason of, uh, actual reason what kind of um, uh, activities they, they actually do. And uh, um, what we can see uh, uh, or how we find out about uh, their existence is by doing like research with and uh, interviewing people who live there and also people on the move who can share their experiences of encountering this different, um, uh, organiz uh, different policing um, units. Um, the second the thing that I would like to uh, um, uh, uh, which is a kind of uh, consequence of uh, this uh, illegalization of stay outside the state run system is uh, practically the, the state is uh, forcing uh, different humanitarian organizations to conduct, uh, to go into the sector of humanitarian underground, as one colleague has put it, meaning that they can provide aid uh, constantly in fear that they will, their activity of giving someone a blanket or bread or food or anything uh, will uh, become, uh, uh, will be abused as uh, against them uh, as uh, something that can lead to uh, termination of uh, their possible activities in the future and, and in case of foreign humanitarian workers. Uh, uh, with the uh, uh, expelling from uh, from the territory of the state. Uh, so um, uh, this uh, humanitarian, so practically uh, these repressive practices uh, are um, making, uh, um, re resulting in a kind of really uh, marginalized um, uh, in a way, that people who are trying to, to support people on the move in any uh, other than state system uh, have uh, to be really uh, to conduct their activities very low profile and trying to avoid direct confrontation with the state. 
Um, there is, for example, one, exa uh, one example from 2017, uh, when the, uh, uh, 16, when there were some protests uh, in 17, protest marches uh, from, uh, by people on the move toward uh, state borders in the north and also to the west. Uh, when uh, the, uh, those protests uh, have been framed by state organizations as inspired by, uh, uh, by foreign um, activists and also, uh, for example, no border Serbia activists, uh, even though they were a uh, kind of expression of uh, uh, desperation of people on the move who have been stuck uh, in Serbia for a prolonged period of time. Um, so uh, the third point, which uh, I have already mentioned, is uh, the, the, that militarization and encampment uh, uh, of uh, people on the move into uh, confined spaces is physically shrinking spaces in which uh, 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 any kind of civil sector organization can uh, provide access uh, to people, uh, uh, provide access, access uh, and support people on the move. Uh, also, uh, there is uh, uh, one that I will briefly mention, and I will finish my presentation with this, is that uh, um, uh, this, uh, in media, there is a kind of, um, uh, a presentation that the state holds all um, um, uh, all I don't know uh, controls uh, all migration uh, completely. So there is no um, uh, no uh, need for uh, any kind of interference of grassroots initiatives of um, autonomous um, initiatives of uh, local residents to support people on the move. Uh, but uh, uh, because uh, the situation is presented as the, the state is totally in charge with everything that is happening. Uh, this trend uh, can be followed since 2016 and uh, really uh, kind of a professionalization of uh, uh, migrant support in uh, Serbia. That is, uh, of course, the consequence of uh, term. Uh, term uh, of um, stopping the existence of a uh, migration corridor which existed in the end of in the second part of 2015 and the beginning of 2016. So thank you for this. Uh, thank you, Marta. I just want to kind of reflect uh, something that Marta already I mean, said, it is that use of migration management for managing something else within the states. And I would kind of, uh, later reflect on bit on that and especially like uh, one one of the things that I was thinking about when Marta was uh, talking uh, it's these old fences we kind of have uh, fences to uh, supposedly protect sovereignty than to use it within the framework of nation state because it's because we need a patriotism to actually kind of but then we again fence the people either in those concentration camp or put them in prisons there is a threat for the people who are trying to kind of go be go outside the, the, the obedience is outside of this obedient citizen citizenry so there is kind of and we keep talking about certain issues that we kind of before really felt as guaranteed freedom of assembly, I mean, the freedom of movement, because we now are actually really, really going back to the struggling around freedom of movement. While there is this uh, body of European Union that kind of allows freedom of movement within, within for the certain privileged, uh, then we kind of have these borders around criminalizing people trying who are not allowed to enter because there is a there is this question around allowing to enter and only privileged can enter while we can actually as a white people of course travel the world there is definitely regulation of the non-white body if i if i kind of can can say uh, of course it, it is some form of imperialism slash colonialism but just a bit reversed or not even but it's open but uh, really visible with racism and everything i would kind of go to carolina now because she's going to talk a bit about pushbacks and again this 
additional level of fences and borders and the deterrences and allowances who can come in and who can come out or yeah. who is forced to go out as well. I will just ask for the PowerPoint presentation if it's possible. And yeah, so before it's just saying thank you so much for including me to the conference and I'm going to move in between spaces of Eastern Turkey and the border between Ur Turkey and Iran and also Bosnia, Herzegovina and Croatia, which I will show hopefully and argue that these are very shrink spaces as the result of the European Union border controls and the regime that is being regime that is being increasingly externalized and maybe in the future we will see similar patterns in Pakistan, Iran and other countries, not just the region of southeastern Europe and, and Turkey. Um, so yeah, can the PowerPoint present? Ah, it's, it's over, over there. there, thank you. So in 2018 and 2019, I was living in Velika Kladusha in Bosnia and Herzegovina as a PhD student. I was collaborating with the local and international volunteers and activists, but also with Nijara, who is here, and some other people and your friends and colleagues who I'm happy to see again in, in Sarajevo. So thank you for inviting me again here. And uh, uh, as you can see on this photo, there is a camp in Velika Kladusha, Trnovi camp that no more exists. It was demolished, people were moved to Miral camp uh, after they were moved to several other camps, IOM run camps that uh, Gorana and Nijara were discussing. And after, here is the photo of the Iran-Turkey border, which is completely different landscape, completely different picture. There is no makeshift camp, there are really no camps, uh, there is no international volunteer presence. Uh, most of the aid is provided by the local populations who are themselves embedded in different struggles in Eastern Turkey. Um, specifically, the struggle between uh, Turkey, uh, Turkey security forces and Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK. Uh, however, if you see these pictures, although they are ridiculously different, what we've been really observing, I was living uh, in Turkey the last year and was conducting the research at the Iran-Turkey border, is that the EU homogeneously outsources the same border controls, the same policies and the same tools to these completely different contexts in order to target irregular migration. So here you can see the whole route. What really connects these two borders is that the European Commission acknowledge uh, the whole route that is starting from Iran and going to Croatia or to the Bosnian Croatian border as a land route or the green, green borders land route that is leading to the EU. And the people who are trying to enter the EU from Bosnia to Croatia, they have been framed as irregular migrants, and they are the same nationalities who are starting their journeys from, from Iran to Turkey, namely Afghan people, but also people from Pakistan. There are also Bangladeshi people. Increasingly, because of the Turkish southern border has been sealed by the wall, more Syrians are arriving to the border and trying to cross and start their journeys towards the EU or to Turkey uh, from, from this point. Um, uh, yeah. uh, so what I mean by these homogeneous policies and the tool is that, as you all know, of course, Croatia receives incre uh, incredible funds and millions of euros to manage uh, its border with Bosnia-Herzegovina. I try to kind of move there and see my notes, but not to lose the microphone, sorry about it. Um, so, so the major funds were of, co of course going to watchtowers, but also to different surveillance technology, uh, development of the IT system, but also the training of the border guards. There has been a collaboration with the Frontex officials and so on. What we see in this Eastern Turkey is a very similar manner, although the Frontex is not directly present at the border, but the EU is indirectly present at the border and somehow orchestrates the similar patterns of border controls as at the Croatian-Bosnian uh, border. 
So, for example, maybe after Taliban seized control of Afghanistan, many Western media suddenly kind of snatched on the Iran-Turkey border and started portraying this border as, look, this border is suddenly became militarized. There are border controls that are trying to stop Afghan migration or the, as this point of the journey. Maybe there is definitely some correlation why we don't see so many Afghans arriving to this region because the border controls increased already at this point of the route. Um, so, for example, oh, <laughs> I think it's okay. Yeah. But, okay, you okay. Can but if you can stand also, because I want, I want to hear you again. Just switch it on. Hello, hello. No, it's fine. <laughs> I think I can manage. It's, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, the most obvious and visible new border control that we have been observing thanks to the European Commission at this border has been the construction of the border wall with the watchtowers. Uh, Turkish Minister Soylu, he said in media that the European Commission contributed with 110 million euros to construct this border. Uh, it has been almost constructed along the whole border between Iran and Turkey and the future plan is to do the same uh, between Iraqi and Turkish border. Uh, at some point uh, where the border is not really constructed, there are ditches. Uh, we have been already hearing the news and I was interviewing people in Van in Eastern Turkey who were saying that they were climbing over the wall, often they broke their legs or injured themselves. The local residents also said that when they are walking around the area, they found dead people in the ditches where the border wall has, was not constructed. Uh, however, when I was also speaking with some local smugglers, they were often laughing and saying, well, of course, this will, these border controls or the border wall will not actually make any difference in terms of smuggling routes because the smuggling has been used by the local population as a main survival mode and Kurds live on both sides of the borders and uh, often collaborate with the border state authorities. So most of the people who are successfully smuggled, the majority of the cases, they bribe the state authorities with the smugglers. Uh, another tools that I found in some of the official documents by the EU and the European Commission in their budgetary uh, reports, where for example, uh, that they also supplied these border controls with the watchtowers, but also they provided some training of the border patrols, which very importantly, it needs to be highlighted that the border patrols are actually Gendarma, the Gendarmerie General Command, who has been deployed at the border since the 1980s to fight PKK. So they are involved in the local military conflict and they are the same people who are now benefiting from the funds from the European Commission, which of course is very problematic because the European Commission on one hand in report on Turkey in 2021, also 2020, on one hand they, it has been criticized Turkish security forces for various human rights violations, including the cases of torture and killing of the local residents. However, for the purpose of halting irregular migration, the same border units uh, are granted uh, huge benefits and funds. Also, there is a national police present. Um, Furthermore, there have been some vehicles and surveillance technology of different types that we have been observing especially in completely almost the same way in the Croatian-Bosnian border. And also, um, you know, when we are discussing the EU-Turkey uh, agreement in 2016, what has been mostly celebrated is the, is the humanitarian aid for Syrian refugees and hosting communities. However, of course, these funds supported uh, the FRIT funding, supported the accommodation centers, but in Eastern Turkey, this means that there were two new removal centers constructed and they are not really for the purpose to accommodate people, but they are for the purpose to smooth the pathway of removing people. That was the case, especially of Afghans, uh, as fast as possible. Also, some of the refugees who I was interviewing, they said that they were taken to removal centers after the army picked them up, took them back to the border and pushed them back to Iran. Just uh, to show the photo of the new wall, it's actually the double wall and uh, it's surveyed by the Gendarme soldiers. And um, well, what I want to highlight is that we often discuss pushbacks, but for the purpose of the discussions that we are having today, I would like to divide this term into push and back.
because I feel that these are two different processes that intervene into border controls. The push is very directly orchestrated and supported by the EU management and funds and the equipment that is directly given to the border patrols. But the, what's happening after the people are back is very much also shaped by the local geopolitics of transit states, which is often forgotten. And uh, also, while we are discussing the pushbacks, what's happening during the push, the violence often continues after people are removed uh, from, from certain spaces. So at the Iran-Turkey border, very much the interviews that I conducted are completely uh, symmetrical to those conducted at the Croatian-Bosnian border since 2016. Uh, this is very interesting because this is the year that marked the EU-Turkey agreement. Uh, the people were reporting being forcibly removed, denied asylum procedures. Uh, they were destroyed, often their private possessions. Uh, there were cases of also physical and sexual abuse um, and theft of money and especially the phones to hinder the future journey. So we can see that uh, at the both border locations. So uh, when I mentioned that uh, the EU is directly and indirectly involved or what this orchestration means, I wanted to use the quote of one uh, Afghan guy who is giving pseudonym here to just uh, protect this anonymity, who said that the border wall beatings and pushbacks at the Iran-Turkey border do not exist because Turkey does not want us, it's because no one wants us. And of course, it mainly applies not for the West, but for Europe. In a case of Turkey, it's also important to say that I haven't mentioned is that only European citizens can claim asylum in Turkey. So Syrians were given this special uh, protection status. However, if you are non-Syrian, non-European, namely Afghan, and you want to stay in Turkey, it's impossible. I mean, you can apply for for international protection, but the status is only temporary because the temp uh, international protection works on the system that you will be relocated. So in the past, UNH UNHCR were granting the status <coughs> based on the belief that these people will be relocated to the EU or to the US or to Canada, but the people who were granted this positive status, most of them have been waiting in Turkey up to 10 years even. So, and right now the Turkish government, uh, the DGMM, they right now have the power to control these procedures and they really crack down. I mean, there was over 90% decline in positive international protection statuses since the DGMM, the Turkish government took over because they really worried that people would overstay and they know that no one is willing to resettle these people, so they are cracking down on the uh, applications and because there is limited space in removal centers, what they do is often uh, the pushback. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, but when people are back, not everything is just happening because of the EU. Of course, the transit states, they are active agents, they intervene into border controls geographically, but also politically. So uh, often, you know, people are pushed back either to former or present military zones. In Eastern Turkey, this is quite striking and it's very obvious when some of the gendarme soldiers, they confessed in the past that they were targeting or they claimed that they wanted to target the PKK militias, but they killed on one spot more than dozens of refugees. When I was managed to interview one of the member of gendarme soldier from the unit who was deployed in the southeast, he actually said to me that the military has the right to shoot at anyone who enters the officially declared military zones. And uh, it's very striking because uh, since 2016, namely the whole conflict against the PKK didn't diminish, but it moved to the rural areas. So if you visit the cities, it's not so present. Of course, there are tanks and there is a military presence. However, the conflict and the counter-terror operations keep taking place, especially in a rural border regions, which simultaneously mark the refugee passages.
And uh, yes, this is the photo of the geography. So this is, this is the mountainous region that people navigate when they are trying to cross from Iran to Turkey. Of course, it's very dangerous. Just two weeks ago, there was a case of Afghan woman with her baby who died in the mountains while they were trying to cross, they froze to death. Um, and uh, also there are various other challenges than just the landscape, but also there are cases of the Iranian patrols who either shot people or, or who push people the whole way after back to Afghanistan or they deported them back to Afghanistan. But the violence from the side of the Iranian police has been quite widely also uh, reported. So this you know, whole geopolitics of being back really matters and of course not everything is just uh, homogeneously uh, shaped by the EU but also by the third countries. This is the Ternovi camp again that no more exists but you can see here that uh, in a case of the Croatian Bosnian border especially in the past now people are pushed to the formal camps but people were navigating other forms of violence. I mean most significantly like we notice always when people were injured and they had for example open bleeding wounds and they had no possibility how to treat that so it got infected in the camp it took ages for people to treat their injuries but also to access hygiene uh, there were various cases of hepatitis uh, malnutrition and so on uh, which of course right now it's uh, formally addressed by new formal camp system but as Gorana Nijar and others were discussing this has uh, not really offered a proper solutions of uh, people being safe when they are back. So just to say that um, it's also really important to say that it kind of becomes really useful for the EU to say that uh, or to push people either to Bosnia Herzegovina or Eastern Turkey because these countries are often framed from Eurocentric narrative as very insecure as usual, very unsafe as usual. So whatever happens to people and when they are directly injured or they are in these states, it's often kind of assumed and normalized as but it's normal because they are in those countries. So it kind of redelegates the responsibility not only over border controls, but also responsibility over harms that we are visibly seeing at the borders. Uh, but also the third countries contract these border policies, like in the case of Turkey, uh, as Gorana said that that would be really important to also suggest is that Turkey uh, officially declared, several officials said, that the priority, top number priority one at the Iran-Turkey border is the fight against PKK. It has always been like that since the 1980s and it's not going to change. For the EU, the priority is targeting irregular migration. And there is huge question of how the third countries can abuse these funds and surveillance uh, and all these equipment that they are gaining to actually harm not only or to stop the irregular movement, let's say, but also to target local civilians. And I think that uh, talking with the local politician it's in Van uh, or in Eastern Turkey, it's obvious that more people are opting to leave. As also you said that there are actually many Kurdish uh, refugees or, or people from Turkey who are trying to leave Turkey. And this will not help the situation. So eventually these policies are making the, the movement higher rather than reducing it because it's pushing also the local people to flee uh, or supporting the insecurity that they don't want to live in. And uh, in terms of just the last point I wanted to say is that today or at this panel we are mainly discussing the criminalization of aid or illegalization of movement. Um, I just want to compare Eastern Turkey with the other states a bit. Um, most of the advocacy, most of the aid provision is purely done by the local people in Van. Uh, it's done by the lawyers who have been fighting for human rights, especially of Kurds, for decades, who have been criminalized by themselves for their uh, fight for human rights. And for example, there was a case that uh, the, lo the local activists wanted to or traveled from Istanbul to Eastern Turkey to lay flowers down on the graves of people who died while they were smuggled uh, in Van Lake and they were prevented by army to do so. Officially, it's basically illegal to do any of these acts in Eastern Turkey. So the local people who are engaged in these activities, they're the main ones who are you know, subjected to the criminalization. But also there were, there was a case of two Afghan refugees 
who were advocating for the rights of Afghan community in Van. And one of them, after he spoke out in the media, he was after visited by the security forces who told him that one more time he will speak publicly, he will be deported back to Afghanistan or just purely pushed back to Iran. So I think that there is, again, this uh, question that you mentioned that uh, when the Western, especially journalists coming and, and showing you know, what's happening, these stories and especially this fight uh, for the human rights from the local perspectives or from refugees by themselves has not been really represented, but it's the only one that is systematically and from long term present uh, at the Iran Turkey border. Yes, I think that this is not so important to say because we know already that. Um, um, people are more opting to rely on smugglers. Just one important thing that differs to, for, in Eastern Turkey from the other borders that we really observe there, that people are more likely to be tr uh, like slip into being trafficked as the result of much harsher policies. So there were especially the cases of women who are much more reliant on smugglers because of the wall and the problems uh, that come with the border controls and uh, they ended up being uh, trafficked for sexual purposes. Also, increasingly, we see refugees uh, being exploited and labor, as labor workers in smuggling when they are offered either pay very high fees for being smuggled or working for smugglers for some periods of time, and in return, they will be smuggled. And this, we have actually done research on that at the Croatian-Bosnian border, but we also observe it at the Iran-Turkey border. Just on this photo, this is the graveyard uh, in Van, uh, close to the border with Iran, and it's believed to be one of the biggest graveyards where refugees are buried. Uh, not only because um, during the smuggling accidents, but also while being shot by the security forces, as I mentioned before. And just the last point really is that the pull factor uh, of people, they wanted to move and they are fighting for this free movement. You know, majority of the people, they don't give up. They, the pull factors are often stronger than the push factors. And the collaboration with the local people, the refugee community themselves, but also international uh, volunteers or NGOs in some cases, of course, support this movement. So just to really end up in a bit more positive note, I think that majority of the people who I met either in Bosnia Herzegovina or in Eastern Turkey, they managed somehow to make the journey. It was traumatic and it was horrible. Uh, but they made it, so it's important just to say that, rather than just, of course, discussing all these issues and narratives of violence. Thank you. Uh, I'll just open the floor and for both for Zoom and for the audience and for any commentary or questions. I just want to reflect on something that's been kind of said and kind of the consequence, I mean, in my head at least, <laughs> like uh, there is kind of restriction of movement, but also making uh, people really invisible. Uh, and this tendency to like whether there is a kind of pushing back people uh, outside of European Union or outside of Europe as a global just trying making invisible that increases as well violence. I mean, that increases possibility to people being exposed to violence. Uh, and we kind of, with all this militarization, we see constantly, I mean, as in a war with militarization comes the violence and all the other, I mean, all the other elements of violence, uh, physical, sexual, psychological, any form of violence. And uh, I just kind of, I keep saying, I mean, keep thinking, this is really, um, this migration management or whatever, I just love to talk in quotes, uh, is really so much violence, so much against people, so much against humanity, and um, not sure how to kind of, we open, we, we are now in panel that presents really uh, these elements, but as you said as well, it's important to say that people do kind of get, unfortunately, I mean, it's a trauma, it's like, I'm certain with many of them really remain like that 
that remains present, that struggle actually is, uh, why would anyone have to kind of go through all that? And that's really that we have to keep asking ourselves why anyone has to be forced to take this journey, to actually be exposed to not only, I mean, and important thing as well, when you mentioned it, smug, I mean, trafficking, quite, I mean, we are facing in certain ways, the new system of uh, slavery, which is kind of the, for, through the, uh, forced into through the uh, migration management kind of system as well. So any Just question? Can I, can yeah. I say something? I like most of the time when there is some discussion especially with the policymakers from the commission or from the eu or member members of the eu parliament like one of the major questions they always ask like how come that these people can uh, afford to pay these high prices so are they really refugees i mean they have to have some money you know or are they involved in smuggling or what's happening with it this is like a, one of the major questions that always comes out and the answer is the increasing exploitation and trafficking. And this has been really booming, especially thanks to these very tough border controls, and it should be reminded. Yeah. Uh, do we have, I mean, I still don't have anything from the Zoom, but uh, do we have a question? Okay, uh, we have two questions there. Microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks very much for these impressive insights um, and also hard to digest, I must say. Um, I, I just, I really like the way, um, Carolina, you, you unpacked the term pushback. Um, and I wonder how, and this is really an open question to, to all of us probably, um, because I, f I feel like there has been a tendency to get used to certain um, crimes, breaches of law, brutalities that we witness, um, be it um, at uh, the external borders, be it um, as we've um, seen them towards people on the move or those showing solidarity. I mean, all these things have been, um, these, these issues are there and they are, they are there for, for, for years now and we keep uh, reading reports and witnesses and I wonder um, how to, maybe it's, it's helpful to unpack these terms. This is something I struggle myself. Maybe it's good to, because we, maybe people got used to, okay, we have seen pushbacks. We know there are pushbacks at the borders. We stop thinking about what this really means, but acknowledge the fact that this is ongoing. And um, I, I, I wonder, do you have an idea how to really um, make these um, issues being seen and heard? Um, because they keep happening over the years and we have the reports and we have the witnesses and we have um, footage and um, so yeah this is I guess an open question to all of us I don't shall we collect questions or we can I mean I think we can just kind of have those two questions and then try to do the circle around Um, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Joros uh, Christidis. I'm a reporter for The Spiegel in Greece. So I'd just like to add to what Neda just said. Uh, my, my question is kind of similar uh, because we see that uh, despite all the reporting about pushbacks, all the work you guys are doing, uh, all the work we, we are trying to do in, in, in um, exposing the facts and, and what's happening, uh, the reality is that, that these policies are very popular. There was a poll in Greece uh, the, the, uh, a couple of days ago. Migration is now considered as a problem uh, in Greek society by only 1% uh, of the population. Um, whereas, uh, I don't know, like a year or two ago, it was more than 70%, which means that this policy of deterrence and pushbacks has been uh, very, very uh, politically beneficial for, for the government. Uh, so I sometimes think that whenever we publish a story that, that sort of exposes those human rights violations, 
we're actually doing uh, doing them a favor instead of uh, actually uh, helping uh, I don't know uh, stop the practice uh, in a way. So um, I was just wondering how how do we move sorry how do we move beyond this um, 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 I don't know fighting with windmills if you will, if you will and and making people understand that what's happening is not. Uh, something that we should be uh, proud of as, as as European citizens, or something that that must that must change. Uh, and just if, if I may, just a second question for Carolina. Um, uh, I was wondering if if you have any uh, idea whether um, um, reports and information we get about forced deportations from Turkey to to Syria, uh, and uh, and and recently to Afghanistan as well, after some sort of. Uh, that approachment with the Taliban government uh, is taking place. Thank you. Uh, from somebody else. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question for Carolina, as you mentioned, uh, violence on the Iranian side of the Turkey Iran border as well. I was wondering if you have heard any explanations on who is doing this? Is this Iranian authorities? Could they or something more irregular? Uh, Thanks. You mean in Iran specifically? On the Iranian side, yeah, okay. uh, the border, yeah. And any other? Merci. And then we can kind of, no, there is Merci, and then we can actually go around. Um, I will just ask the question that I was asking the first panel, but now different. Uh, I was, we were asked what about the mental health of the refugees and migrants, and I will ask what about the mental health of the people who are working on the borders because we are facing uh, even burnout or even to ask uh, some help. So how are you managing? Even when you do the research, you enter in the skin of all these people and all this mind, and it's very hard to just be a simple researcher just to become, because you're a human. So how you deal with uh, your mental health? Uh, we have, we, we, yeah, we can, uh, oh, uh, Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer. You can no, no. You can you can just add the question, and then we we are going to go around to do the answering. I I don't know. It is a question or it is a comment. Okay. Uh, you can yeah conceptualize it however you want. Uh, but since my colleague asked about mental health, uh, and the Karina also mentioned about the reconstructions of the border, and uh, to close this ditch not let the people pass over that. I am really wondering, I guess all these people here knows, these people who are on the move doesn't have intention to stay in their country, either in Turkey or Bosnia, and they are way on the Europe. And why EU is spending thousands of money to reconstructing the border instead of teaching and educating these people and make them ready and integrate in their society more easily. Because what you are talking so far, it is kind of just theoretical stage for me. And so is there any answer for this? And for me, it is just vesting of money and vesting of time, not let these people to pass over the border. They will find the way and they will find uh, anyhow, any space to pass. And so why EU? I, I am sure EU is much more wiser and they already no. think about all these issues. Why they waste really money to reconstruct the border instead of the let these people to be ready to live in the EU more not, nicely i mean i don't know is that question is that a comment however you want to take it you can take it but i really wonder the answer for this question okay uh can we just do the round the same round as we had and just reflect and then we see yes uh okay um yeah, I mean, uh, with regard to the questions that I, I'm more <laughs> competent to answer, pushbacks. Uh, pushbacks are an illegal practice we've seen Greece since the very early 90s or uh, the first uh, migration influences in Greece. Uh, 
uh, we are uh, also in RSA, there are people that they are monitoring pushback since the very early beginning. They happen, they never stopped happening. They slew, da they slew down for a while during the previous government, but they didn't stop. But it, they, they have intensified the last uh, years. Uh, pushbacks is an illegal practice, but at the same time, we must bear in mind that uh, pushbacks had been legalized in the eyes uh, of the people, uh, especially with the EU-Turkey deal of 2016. Actually, what we, we never considered before as an option for a state, um, how they would manage their asylum applications of uh, applicants coming through Turkey, it became a reality. They decided that they will not judge on these asylum applications because their sole objective was to return people back to Turkey. The, so the, if you, you, you can consider readmissions to Turkey uh, legal, it's not very far to uh, return people in the middle of the night illegally. Uh, in the end, after all, you're returning them to a safe third country. <laughs> uh, so it is really hard to tackle uh, pushbacks. I think we have been, uh, we, we all went public enough. Uh, pushbacks are everywhere. Just you write the word pushback. All uh, actions of the Greek Coast Guard, the Greek police, uh, come out uh, straight from the beginning. So I think what we really have to, to try to change is, all, is the mentality and the, the way of thinking of the, of the society. Uh, of course, me and other colleagues as lawyers, we will continue to appeal to justice for this, but we are not very optimistic about it. Uh, emergency appeals may be successful at times. Uh, we as RSA had cases where we had appealed to the European Court of Human Rights for interim measures to stop an ongoing pushback. Uh, by the time that the court uh, responded uh, and gave a, a, a deadline to the government to reply to the allegations, the person was already in Turkey. So. We have to be united in this and we have to mobilize the society and people to continue reporting, being a watchdog for this and change also their stance. As this is something really brutal. Maybe the Ukrainian crisis and refugees from the Ukraine is a good, uh, uh, is a sad, uh, is, <laughs> is a sad occasion, but uh, a good reason to start rethinking of how the societies respond to refugees, their movement, and their need to receive protection. Um, I would say that the uh, European Commission has a, a very big uh, part of responsibility, and this is, has to be more clear in the future. Uh, it's not enough for the commissioner to call the authorities to step up investigations and so on. The commission, the, the European institutions have to step up and say it's enough is enough. We will do it, we will find, we will research, we will make a thorough investigation uh, for these instances of illegal practices. And the last point I will mention is the, about the question about the mental health of the people at the borders. Borders are always very difficult uh, areas to live. Even locals uh, who are not maybe uh, involved in the refugee issues have a, a particular uh, sentimental situation. The, the, in the borders, there's widespread fear. Uh, there is always the, the fear of the enemy of the other side and also, uh, but uh, along this uh, mentality, which is really scaring people and preventing them from really thinking clearly of who is the other person uh, opposite them. I mean, the, the people, they are the people that work with refugees, uh, professionals or not professionals, they're really facing burnouts. It's really clear, I think, in all countries. 
we we faced this in, in 2006 with very uh, increase when uh, deportations to Turkey were really stepping up. I was at that time in Lesbos. It was a really hard uh, time. I mean, solidarity among uh, each other, among us, it's one way to to feel better, to give uh, people uh, space to discuss and relieve and uh, narrate their experiences and feel that they are not alone. At the same time, any mental support services, any mental supervision is, is very welcome, but I'm afraid not all organizations or individuals have the chance or can afford to provide such services. Diana? Yeah, so just to continue from uh, what Eleni said, and first regarding mental health and taking care of our mental health. Uh, I don't know, for example, I have the incredible privilege of being a beneficiary of frontline defenders who pay for psychological support for me. But this is not the case for many people who are in these situations and getting psychological support is expensive. Not everyone can afford it. And of course, not all of the organizations provide uh, support for their workers or their volunteers and so on. And as for the questions on uh, both pushbacks and this uh, comment about uh, spending money is um, there's a film from, I think, 2013 called Quien es Diane Cristal, which actually follows a Central American migrant on his journey through the desert and into the US. And uh, he, he doesn't make it, unfortunately, and his body is transferred back to Honduras where his brother is at his funeral and he's talking and he's saying, you know, the United States is investing millions of dollars in this wall. And he, he asks, why invest in something that is inanimate? Why not invest in human beings? So in essence, I've been asking myself the same question uh, <laughs> as you, and especially after seeing the numbers that Carolina put in her presentation, when you compare the numbers that we have for the so-called security, for the um, uh, for taking care of our borders and the money that organizations get, it's really um, it's really sad. And as for the pushbacks, it's um, I don't actually know what else we can do because for six years we've been talking about this. We've been um, advocating. Uh, recently, the Spiegel had excellent uh, coverage and evidence of the pushbacks. And what hurts is that we have to make a spectacle of it. We have to make a spectacle of the violence that these people are put through because otherwise no one takes them for their word. They're not seen as reliable witnesses for their own lives, for what happens to them. And what needs to happen, I think, is, well, I mean, a little bit utopian, you know, but this shift in, a, in, a, in our collective consciousness that by raising these walls, which are said to protect us, we are imprisoning ourselves also, that we imprison ourselves in this notion of the nation state of defending our so-called sovereignty of these things. And we need to shift away from that and we need to like free ourselves because the real crime is the border regime. Thank you. Uh, we can actually go to Marta and I would actually ask Marta as well to reflect on, if, if you can, uh, to reflect on uh, what was the question regarding Push, I mean, if we focus and publish more on pushbacks and how uh, how this kind of is abused by mobilization within country, especially, I don't know whether it's possible to reflect in Serbia and kind of mobilization against the people on the move in the context of uh, even, I don't know, political situation, elections or anything, uh, and kind of focusing, like when you actually focus on uh, violence against people on the move, how that is again abused by the government or people on, in power to create a new form of violence. If you can, I you don't have to just. Yeah, uh, Carolina has mentioned uh, earlier that uh, um, uh, the the images of uh, 
uh, cramped camps in uh, border areas, external European border areas are used as uh, a kind of, of uh, shifting blame to those states, how they function and they are failed states and nothing is working there. There are no real standards and so on. Um, uh, uh, pushbacks, which are conducted by the uh, uh, states of the European Union, uh, are resulting in uh, people uh, uh, being stuck uh, on the northern borders of uh, Western Balkan states, uh, and especially in Serbia. So there are several state-run camps there, which are crowded because uh, uh, people gravitate, um, uh, would like to be in those camps uh, and uh, more than to be further back on the south. Uh, and also there are a lot of um, um, autonomous settlement built by people on the move or uh, organized by movement facilitators in, the, in that area. And this um, uh, situation is used by some white uh, wing uh, extremist groups, uh, 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 which are, uh, for example, there is one which is called Pe People's Patrols, which is uh, actually patrolling in this organizing raids in these uh, uh, makeshift camps or um, um, uh, harassing people, stealing them their mobile phones and so on, and on occasion. A year ago, uh, they uh, practically uh, taken by force uh, some several tens of persons, and uh, from uh, uh, one um, uh, makeshift camp uh, in um, train station, and uh, wanted to put them into the state-run center. And there was a clash between workers of the state-run center and of these patrols. But um, uh, this situation is um, uh, uh, used to, to, so a situation produced by the European border regime <coughs> is interpreted uh, as um, something that is uh, inherent to people on the move, that they like to, to, to uh, live in those areas and they, I don't know, uh, do not want to be uh, inside the camps which are full and so on. Uh, also, um, until uh, the end of 2019, migration as such was not uh, a kind of uh, a part of official uh, policies uh, or political programs of uh, uh, formal political parties in Serbia. And in the end of 2019, uh, uh, that potential, potential was recognized by several parties uh, who began to spread, uh, 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 among other things, uh, uh, recent, uh, that um, uh, 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 residence replacement theory, and also they pushed uh, some of the very uh, some of the shady agreements between Serbia and. Uh, uh, European Union member states uh, regarding readmission agreement and so on as uh, they frame it uh, as something uh, that uh, will result in a settlement of million uh, of people from Middle East and Africa who managed to reach the European Union and now they're going to be readmitted uh, back uh, to Serbia. Uh, so this is something that, that is like very, very present and um, uh, Mm, increasingly, it was uh, uh, the height hype of that was happening during the uh, again uh, that uh, state of emergency in 2020 regarding Corona when people were stuck in um, uh, could not leave their homes um, uh, and uh, their uh, the root spreading of the narratives that uh, uh, the state is organizing uh, settlement of people on the move. Uh, while people are dying of corona and so on. So there is a lot of those conspiracy theories present and uh, which are again uh, propagated by some of the official political parties, some of which used to be members uh, uh, part of the parliament. Um, what I would like to go back is uh, uh, to, to the comment, uh, the 
and that uh, migration management is not really done for the purpose of migration management as such, but there, it has some, some different goals. Uh, nothing is done uh, in those in the buffer states for people to move to 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 become part of the society, to make their lives better, to to integrate them into the uh, societies uh, uh, for which people are moving to the European Union and can search for better works and uh, working condition and so on. Uh, but actually, they're just like keepers of uh, people on the move from going further to, to the European Union. So migration management, as uh, defined as such, is not purpose for itself. Uh, it is just a kind of excuse word for uh, different uh, things like uh, um, accession to the European Union above all, because it is uh, said to be the main strategy, uh, main um, uh, strategic goal of Western Balkan states, and also uh, all those um, uh, acts uh, which concern uh, uh, integrated border management, uh, combat against illegal migration, and so on, are uh, uh, having their, their preambulas. Uh, that uh, they are done uh, in sake of uh, access uh, to the European Union. So migration management is like officially not purpose of migration management practices and transformations that are uh, being conducted, but it is just one instrument for getting something else. And of course, uh, uh, migration is really on a local level, uh, uh, in national context, in region context, used for different political pressures. Uh, for example, to confiscate uh, land in certain areas and not in certain other areas, to make camps in certain areas and not in others and so on. Uh, and uh, so, so it is a, a whole migration is political instrument, like how it is framed and how it is used and uh, abused. People who are the like objects of these uh, policies are really just tokens in, in some larger political and economic games which are happening in the region. Thank you, Karolina. Yeah, I think I'm just going um, to the last question about uh, why the EU is acting that way, if it's actually not functional, why there is no more focus on humanitarian support and assistance. I mean, first of all, it's really important to say the EU is not one person, it's just so many different state, it's states, it's not homogeneous, it's very um, heteronymous, right? Like, it, there are so many interests, so many parties, and so many tools, so many different policy tools. So, I think what we really observe that uh, the states that are subjected to much further externalization from the EU, such as Turkey, Pakistan, in the future also Iran, and in Pakistan it's already happening, but not so really discussed in public. In Turkey, it's very much discussed, is humanitarian aid. But somehow this humanitarian aid is serving for security purpose to prevent people move somewhere because there is a logic that if they're kind of happy they have humanitarian aid, for example, access to schooling. In terms of the EU-Turkey agreement, we have been hearing much about cash assistance for Syrians, access to labor, access to education, access to healthcare, and so on and so on. On the ground there are so many challenges and we cannot say that this is functional, right? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there is still much more rigor on securitization and militarization of the borders. I think that is going back to your question about, so why we are discussing pushback, what can we do more? Because we have been talking about it uh, for such a long time and sometimes being part of the border violence monitoring network that myself, I always thought, okay, we just need to monitor it systematically and just prove the same thing again and again and again, you know, but at the end of the day, as you mentioned, these voices do not count. So what can we do different? And sometimes when communicating with different policymakers, I felt that the thing that challenged them was to show them that the interest they want is not working because of the policies they are implementing. So for example, in, in the case of Libya, Egypt, Eastern Turkey and other countries that are already very violent themselves and very insecure for the local people, if you say that these policies not only push refugees to not to stay there 
as the policymakers want, but also pushing the local people flee. So they have double refugee movement, you know, as the result of that. This is something that maybe they would listen to because they don't want this movement. So there needs to be like probably more rigor to show that the violence doesn't actually stop people, but it's pushing them to move forward. And that should be highlighted a bit more because I'm often really struck that they don't acknowledge that. They think that it really works. It's reducing the movement and this is what's the most important. Recently I interviewed one of the members of the European Parliament and she said to me, quote by quote, everything is better than irregular migration to Europe. So, um, you know, from this perspective it needs to be challenged and also going to the point of uh, going back to the terms that we are so much familiarized with, they have been normalized. I mean, if you say pushback, everyone just pictures very specific procedure of people being removed from the country, beaten up, and that's it. But it's so much more. It's a process. People are stuck in this process for years. And Marta, I think, once described it in one of her paper, a circular movement. Like, people are circulating in, in this movement again and again, and they are pushed again. So I think it's definitely important to go back to the most basic terms that we ourselves as activists, researchers, policymakers or whoever normalized and try to deconstruct them and question them a bit again from different angles and hopefully wait, there will be some response. But going back to the pushback themselves of monitoring, I think that, uh, you know, often policymakers care about, okay, so it doesn't really stop irregular migration, okay, it doesn't really fight smuggling, and we are really losing money on the local conflicts. These are the points that should be more highlighted rather than just the description of the direct violence that refugees suffer, because this suffering is not in their interest eventually. They are more higher interests uh, for many people in the parliament and many different EU countries uh, that are much more crucial for them than that. Yeah. And also one last question, uh, you also ask about the Iranian uh, violence. Well, it's a bit mystery what's happening on the Iranian side because often sometimes this Iranian army that is deployed uh, at the border, not only for migration, but also the fight against the PKK. There has been different, in, in the history or in the recent history, there have been different attempts between Turkey and Iran to, you know, have some collaboration to fight PKK or at least to prevent PKK entering, uh, entering Turkey from Iran and Iraq after Turkey accused Iran for providing a safe space for PKK being trained and after uh, crossing the border. So there was again completely black hole of communication, nothing happened. Uh, so it's really difficult to find out who do that. Refugees often say it's either army or border patrols. They never would say that it's like a national police or someone like that. But uh, I think that Iranian politics itself or their presence at the border is very mysterious and it's very difficult also to investigate or question because there are no official documents or, or news about what is really happening on the other side of the border. And that's current research gap that should be addressed in the future, mainly in cooperation with some uh, Iranians who are living in Iran or at least present in the country. Uh, thanks. We are actually almost uh, at the end, but I do have one question for you, Carolina, from Zoom, and then there is one more, I would say, from Bosnian side, so I'll reply, <laughs> I'll respond. But a uh, question from Mama. Uh, my question uh, to Carolina, uh, Carolina, it seems that uh, the way pushbacks are happening along the route from Iran to Croatia are similar or same. But maybe could you mention critical differences, if any, between distinct border control strategies of the countries along this route? So it, it is more like you did actually already mention some, but yes. just I would kind of maybe just absolutely like i think the local context of that actually they are officially declared military zones so this is the major difference the very high probability that the army has the right as one of the members of the gendarmerie mentioned they have the right to shoot people who enter the military zones under the suspicion that they are pkk militias uh, on one hand, this soldier also said to me that because of the more surveillance technique, they can see from higher distance if it's a group with the women and children or uh, if it's a like, group of men, but after their claims in sense that he was also saying, well, when we see donkeys, we immediately assume that these are PKK militias smuggling either drugs or weapons. 
but smugglers use donkeys as well to transport people's possessions. So these interconnections on the ground are very tight. And I think this is the major difference in the Eastern Turkey. So the local context matter. And it's important, again, to highlight that the third country's transit stay, their political situation, geography, they are not just passively there, but they are very much shaping of what's happening. Although, of course, it's, uh, I still think it's orchestrated mainly by the EU support. However, what happened to people after they are back, it's very much uh, um, shaped by the, by the local geopolitics. So this is the major difference. So there are differences uh, in what people navigate after they are removed from certain countries. Okay, thanks. Uh, is there anyone else or any comments from the floor? Andrea? Uh, thank, <laughs> thanks. Uh, very interesting uh, intervention. I, I have a comment, I mean, um, especially on the issue of push and back. I think it's a very good way to, to deconstruct, but it's also important since now many years of uh, different uh, attempt to deconstruct these terms. Um, and it's also linked a bit on what you were mentioning about the you know the the financial uh, part of also the war it's actually a war it's actually a war on on migration it's a war against movement and maybe i mean this is not the first time we have already discussing uh, uh, since some years with many of you about uh, this topic but i think it's good to, re to remind to all of us that to continue to discuss about pushback within the frame of the asylum law, uh, it has been a failure since many, many years. And at the end, we don't need to demonstrate, we don't need to prove that pushback are illegal or are against uh, human rights. I think what needs to be done, and there are different attempts since, uh, since few years, is that actually these are um, criminal <laughs> and these are criminal acts. Uh, there are also uh, different legal and you know, people that are more knowledge than me on the legal, uh, on the legal uh, mysteries. <laughs> they, they know what I'm talking about. So there are different attempts in order to look into these crimes as a criminal act. And as well, uh, we have been, uh, some of you have mentioned about you know, the, the, spect the spectacles of violence. Uh, well, I think also to continue to focus on borders, this has been another discussion which we have been uh, having since very long time. It is also a failure in a way, because uh, it's not only about the border areas, the borderlands, uh, violence is not only you know, at the spot, uh, at the lines. And actually, that's why I think it's important to look at push and back, because people, when they're back, they're not only stuck in the, in the border areas, they end up in other infrastructures. Uh, many of us has done extensive research about camps, uh, camps infrastructures, prisons, and so on, but also policies there their life are managed by different policies of so-called integration and, and so on. So maybe looking into the issue of migration, the war on migration from different perspective, maybe give us an opportunity not to, to continue to frame it with the same key terms, but maybe to, to rethink about this key key terms. We can talk about the right to housing, the right to work, uh, we can talk about social rights, and, uh, and maybe we can find a lot of similarities with what uh, Dijara, but also other people were saying, okay, people are living also from this place uh, because they don't have uh, access to work, they don't have access to health, they don't, have, they don't have access to housing. So maybe we can find a lot of similarities between different struggles. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone that wants to comment or? Can I just, yeah, I mean, the, the thing about the asylum and thinking about pushbacks from the perspective of law, that it's problematic. I completely agree because often, you know, people who are pushed back, according to some European standards, most of them are never uh, admitted to seek asylum or their asylum claims are rejected. 
And there has been this argument by many of the politicians who are saying, well, these are not really refugees, so they are not pushed back, right? Because they don't need to be denied asylum because they have no right to be granted asylum. So there is definitely a need uh, to move beyond this legal perception because at the end of the day, the concept of irregular migration is, as you said, very racialized. It rely on social constructs of religion, race, and, uh, and the people themselves who are on the move rather than just the law. It's much more than the law. So that should be reflected. And I think, you know, academia is trying to do that, but the real challenge is how we will make it practical, how we will make this discussion part of the everyday conversations that can challenge the narrative that pushbacks are wrong and they should not take place. Thank you. I will actually, as, as I said, we have another question from Zoom that I kind of will reflect because it's a standard question that we keep kind of getting in a public space. Uh, it's a question of uh, those that make a criminal activities in Bosnia or in the country and not being punished. But the point being is that, yes, the, when it comes to committing crimes, the police is quite quick to react. And yes, they do quite, uh, kind of are efficient in that sense. The problem is that we do not have monitoring of the for example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we don't have monitoring of trials when it concerns per person that is arrested on the move and whether kind of there are indications that even the question of identification is uh, really uh, racial, like racial stereotypication, like their prejudices are involved. And the question is really whether the person is like, you know, there are so many different, different levels of that aspect that is, uh, that, that, that in Bosnia, at least from Bosnian perspective, isn't at place. So there is no one is monitoring trials, no one is monitoring arrests, no, one's, no one independently is kind of, but even when the crimes are committed against uh, people on the move, uh, on, the, on just everyday basis, they do not have anyone to actually turn to and those crimes are in punched. In recent, uh, uh, recent last year or in Jared, or year before we even had a murder reported in the camp Ushivak, uh, that was committed by the secure private security but that was never prosecuted so i mean uh, i just wanted to kind of i do have a it wasn't part of this panel but i did because the part, it was a question from zoom just to reflect and just to say uh, yes that we always have these con contra arguments where we really like to kind of additionally criminalize people on the move using one or two examples that are there but as everywhere else but again not questioning the human rights even in those perspectives even in the perspective of trials uh trials or even arrests so uh, if, if do anyone has any comments so we can actually conclude yes um i was just uh... I was just thinking uh, that all this is, I mean, uh, on the background, we must have uh, in mind that they take place during a, a time and era that uh, the new uh, migration pact <laughs> is, is going to come. Uh, and this pact, I mean, we, we, we should bear in mind that it also uh, promotes uh, not the protection uh, of the rights of the people uh, in need of international protection, but uh, politicized ideas of um, uh, what is the need for migration and that we should stop the, the instrumentalization, which is a new term, of, my, of migration and which is used by smugglers networks and other countries to make policies. So using this kind of terms, it's very illustrative of uh, what is the general atmosphere and why all these violations are endorsed <laughs> and supported by uh, institutions such as uh, European bodies. So the, the thing is that we have to go back to the basic and say that these are people in need of protection and and this is the only thing that should be bear in mind
and migrations were always part of human history. So that's another kind of real, like really no, you basic don't need thing. to instrumentalize. Yes, I mean it. it's it's just a really basic uh, thing. Thank you yeah. all. See you. See you later. Bye.